Apple reports earnings, girls no longer have to play Steve in Minecraft, and we lawyer up with Denise Howell. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 325 for Monday, April 27th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company information. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. If it's your first time watching or listening, welcome. I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we cover the day's top tech news and talk to experts about the news. If you're a regular viewer or listener, welcome back, and thanks for supporting us and our sponsors. Now let's get to the news. Venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins won their gender discrimination case against former employee Ellen Powell, and now they are asking Powell to pay the $972,815 in legal costs that they racked up to fight the case. But the firm says they'll foot the bill themselves if Powell agrees not to appeal the case. When I reported this last week, I said that I needed someone to explain to me why this wasn't bribery. So joining us today is lawyer, blogger, and host of This Week in Law on Twit, Denise Howell. Welcome, Denise. Hi, Megan. Good to see you. It's good to see you. So is this bribery? Uh, no, this is business as usual in litigation. And uh, you were very careful to say that what they are asking... Um, or what they're bargaining with here are the legal costs. And that is something in the United States that's distinct from the attorney's fees, believe it or not. So it's very, very expensive to litigate lawsuits, particularly lawsuits like the one that we're talking about here, the uh, Ellen Powell case that went all the way through trial. Um, and now the parties are potentially looking at an appeal and appeals take the trial expenses and just ramp them up, right? Both the attorney's fees, which is what the lawyers charge for their time on the case, which can get very, very expensive, and the costs. And the costs are what you would think of as out-of-pocket expenses, not the attorney's fees related to the case. So we're talking about the expert witness fees, um, anything else related to the case that's not the actual billing of lawyer time, uh, copies, <laughs> right. things like that. Um, so uh, those that's what that 972,000 and change number represents. And uh, that is what Ellen Powell, having lost her case at trial, owes under US law. Uh, the, the losing party often has to pay the other side's costs. Well, there are some instances where you actually have to pay the other side's attorney's fees too. And I guarantee you that Kleiner Perkins attorney's fees are well more than $972,000. Right. And presumably she has her own costs that she had to pay for bringing the case to trial, right? Right. So it's a little disincentive. You have to be um, very confident that you have a case that you think you're going to win because at minimum, you're going to be on the hook for the other side's costs if you lose. You might also, depending on what kind of lawsuit it is, whether there's a statute that says that you might also owe attorneys fees at the end too. So that is, in, it's designed to make people think long and hard before they bring a lawsuit. Can I really win this thing? Do I really feel like this has a good shot? Um, so it's it's not unusual for the costs to be in this kind of suit, the kinds of net dollars we're talking about. So right. it's actually, um, you know, a reasonable offer uh, for Kleiner Perkins to come in and say, you know, you owe us these costs, but if we just agree to walk away here, we'll walk away from the costs. So, I mean, if anyone is still thinking that she did this for the money, they um, probably this would uh, dissuade them of that. I mean, Forbes reported that they offered, that Kleiner Perkins offered her a million dollars to settle before the case even, she brought the case to, to court. I mean, that that's accurate, correct? I uh, Actually, I'm not party to what settlement negotiations went on uh, between the parties. I, I did read that uh, in the filing, Kleiner Perkins has come in and say, hey, we offered her a bunch of money to settle and we never heard back. I believe that's what the coverage says. Um, which is really surprising to me. Um, you know, oft oftentimes 
more often than not in a case like this, you're going to find judges really hammering on the parties to get into settlement talks and maybe even having mediation, uh, getting together with someone who's a specialist in settling cases. And I would have expected all that to happen in this case. I'm sort of surprised to hear Kleiner Perkins saying it didn't. Right. I mean, because it was really bad PR for them, even when they won. I mean, it was still like, I mean, they won in the court, but I mean, I think people, a lot of people on social media, uh, I mean, I would say they lost on social media. <laughs> you know, people, right. they do not look good. So, mm -hmm. and then the spokesperson also said that, that in, in saying like, we'll waive the fees, they said, we believe that women in technology would be best served by having all parties focus on making progress on the issues of gender diversity outside of continued litigation. Uh, do you think that's accurate? Do you think Are you works? asking me to gauge the sincerity of that comment? That's hard to do. Um, it, it's it's definitely I would I would say it's an accurate comment. I think that that there's um, a lot to be gained by um, taking what would be um, a, a lot more legal fees spent by both parties and maybe rechanneling that energy. Is that really what what the parties would do with the money they saved? I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. It, it smacks to me of, of a bit of PR spin going on here. But, um, you know, Ellen, Ellen Powell, if she's, uh, she's already talking to appellate lawyers, she's making determinations about the strength of her appeal. And once again, she's going to have to make a judgment call. Um, does she really feel like she has good arguments to make on appeal that could then set aside that trial verdict? She's going to, and if she decides to appeal, She's rolling the dice. She could potentially, if she wins on her appeal, then she won't be on the hook, uh, potentially, for, for those costs that they're seeking. And she might get a new trial at which she could prevail against Kleiner Perkins. An appeal can result in a complete redo of the trial um, with, you know, another up at bat for her, at which point, you know, she would be in the position to say, okay, you know, here we go again, what... What are you going to do about it? Right. Well, the story of gender diversity in Silicon Valley and everywhere is not over yet. Uh, but let's move on to Apple. Um, today, Apple reported record earnings again. We'll cover those at length after the break. But I wanted to ask you what you thought of the legal and privacy issues associated with the new Apple Watch, uh, specifically the health app. Um, NPR asked the question today about whether Apple is doing enough to protect our, our data. Uh, what do you think about this? I, I think this is something that Apple's going to be paying very close attention to. It knows it's definitely in the media crosshairs uh, on this issue, not just the media crosshairs, but also lawmakers, regulators, crosshairs as well. Everyone's paying very close attention and they're not going to want to get this wrong. So I think we just have to wait and see, knowing that that's the case and see if there's some sort of big debacle that ensues where somebody's uh, health information that they're happily supplying to their watch for all the benefits that that uh, brings back to them, whether that somehow leaks out in a way that they never expected or agreed to. And I, I'd be surprised if it happened. I think Apple's paying pretty close attention on this one. Right. I mean, health data is really highly regu regulated, right? I mean, it seems like we always have to sign the HIPAA form and um, so, you know, it's not the same as the information that we're just willingly give to all kinds of, giving to all kinds of sources uh, every day just to get free email or whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So, and I, I think, you know, as, as far as Apple is concerned, I think what we can expect them to do is and, and hope that they will do is uh, try and treat the data not like we're keeping the data, but we're helping you keep track of your data and leaving the data under your control. Um, so again, I think we just have to see how this unfolds. And, and it's been an issue that's been unfolding since they first um, began to put the health app on the phones, right? So we knew the watch was coming and it, that would just amplify um, how this was all gonna play out. But um, again, with it just, you know, getting into onto people's wrists, uh, in the last few days, I think we're pretty early days and need to see where this goes. Right. And I mean, it's, there were a few things that they were going to originally include in the Apple watch. I think that they had to pull back on because they were afraid of, of the legal issues. I can't, I can't remember exactly what they were, but something that they were going to, to detect that they said, well, we can't really do that because it's sort of a morass of legal and medical issues. So yeah, you're right. It's just the beginning. Do you have one? Yeah. 
I don't have one. Um, I haven't, I still am like a couple of generations behind on my iPhone. So <laughs> I think I'm going to fix that first and then uh, see how people do with their watches. Uh, the reviews I've been reading have been a little um, like it's been a lot of trouble for folks. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, ho I'm hoping they get the kinks ironed out of the user experience before I go ahead and give it a try. All right. So let's talk a little bit about streaming media. That's something that's been fascinating me. I think it's sort of a, a generation thing. Um, it feels like a lot of people just automatically take out streaming apps and are, you know, just recording everything that's going around with, you know, no uh, care of who is agreed to be um, recorded and who hasn't. This morning I was talking to Jeffrey Needles, who works here. He's an avid meerkatter. Uh, he was telling me that he, he meerkatted his Apple Watch try-on, uh, and then we got into a discussion about that, whether that's legal and should we... I, I'm just wondering, sh at this point, sh should we all assume that we're being recorded all the time? No, and I, I think it's the people... Um with the recording devices, you know, whether, and, and you'll have to explain to me because I haven't used Meerkat or, or what's the other one? Periscope. Um, Periscope, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do those run on your phone? What device are they um, operating from? They're, they're running on your phone and basically they're live streaming mm -hmm. straight to Twitter. So someone, you know, you just turn it on and all someone else has to do on the other end is click a link and um, they can see. And the difference between Meerkat and Periscope is that Meerkat uh, is like Snapchat, it disappears right away. Mm -hmm. um, you can save it yourself, but Periscope is saved out there, so it's really recorded. So that was another question I had. Is there a difference between streaming video that disappears versus live streaming video that is recorded forever somewhere? As the law stands now, I don't think so, and, and I think it's all just kind of... Um, a wide open field on how this is all going to play out. And what, what I was going to say a moment ago uh, is I think it's the people, whether you're using Google Glass or your phone with a live streaming service or whatever, or maybe something very small and subtle uh, that is residing on you and not terribly obvious as a camera. Um, you asked if people need to assume they're being recorded. I think the assumptions... Uh, and the care needs to be taken by the people with the recording devices because there are a whole array of laws that come into play here, whether we're talking about privacy laws, um, which, you know, if you're uh, taking video of someone in public, um, you're, you're probably okay in most instances. But there's an interesting wrinkle. As soon as you incorporate audio, uh, you're into some legacy laws that all the states have on the books and the federal government too about recording conversations without permission of the people who are being recorded. Um, and the laws on that change uh, vary from state to state. Uh, it, I would, you know, hate to try and tell you <laughs> how to navigate uh, those laws because it's, it's really complicated. But the thing to take away is to know that as, as soon as you're recording someone's conversations you and, and as soon as you're not in a completely public place, you need to be worried about whether you have adequate consent from the people being recorded. And, and getting away from just the legal side of it for a moment and thinking about how we're gonna develop as a society as more and more wearables and you know easily convenient things are able to record what people around you are doing I think that the people doing the recording just need to have some common sense and put themselves in the shoes of their fellow people around and decide whether what they're doing is creepy or not. Because if it is, chances are, if there's not a law against it already, um, the lawmakers will make sure that at some point there is one. If enough people are creeped out about the society that is developing from the technologies around us. Right. I mean, that was, of course, you brought up the issue with Google Glass. Um, so, yeah, it, it is something to follow. Now, you brought up this when I brought up live streaming. You pointed out the legal issues with live streaming other people's content. That's becoming something and people were live streaming Game of Thrones. Um, and, and that's that's not legal. Correct. No, it's not legal. Uh, we talked about this a little bit on last week's This Week in Law. And uh, the the takeaway there is yeah, it's not legal. Are you going to get pursued by HBO or someone else? Uh, the answer is maybe. I mean, it certainly could happen. Um, but all of us on our, our This Week in Law panel didn't really think that this was going to be the next big wave of piracy, that, you know, there's really not going to be a huge demand for um, 
capturing someone's screen by phone and then live streaming it, the quality on that's going to be uh, pretty bad. But uh, yes, it's something that you could be sued for. People who have had music on in the background of YouTube videos, you know, have issues with that. Uh, so uh, you, you definitely need to p uh, pay attention to it and certainly shouldn't think that, hey, I've got a live streaming app. This could be a nice little revenue opportunity for me. I think I'll just, you know, let the world watch the television that I subscribe to. That's that's not a good business model. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Denise, thank you so much. You, of course, host This Week in Law every week. What episode are you on now? Uh, we just did our 300th episode last week. So I was noticing you're you're well into your 300s, 325. So uh, congratulations on that. That's uh, We've been doing our show almost nine years and you've lapped us already. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, to be fair, I only caught up, you know, Sarah has been doing it until January. Yes. So yeah, I, uh, I, I, I personally haven't lapped you, but yes, your show yeah. is all about law. You have great panels of lawyers and experts. And uh, when can people watch it? Fridays at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC right here on Twit. <laughs> of course, you can also subscribe to it. And where's yep. the best, best place for people to follow up on more stories and more of your opinions uh, like the, the ones we just talked about? Uh, well, at our twit.tv slash twill page, uh, we've got links to all the guests that we've had on the show. We've had links to our discussion points, which are at delicious.com slash this week in law. Um, so that's actually a really nice place. Um, you can see as I'm getting ready for the show, uh, what we're planning on discussing in the next episode. And you can catch up on uh, everything we've discussed either by watching the old shows or at least just reading through um, the stories that we've reviewed and getting ready. Well, thank you so much, Denise. Take care. All right. Great to see you, Megan. Good to see you. And coming up, unlock your phone with your ear and another reason never to leave Facebook. But first... Many of you use Dropbox. I do too, all the time. And at Twit, we use it to sync and share files, everything from sharing audio MP3s to large graphic files to invoices and program schedules. And so do people all over the world in 4 million businesses. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. So what is Dropbox for Business? It's the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust, which means less training and more productivity. Simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform and any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte and it's easy to expand if that's not enough. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly, for IT professionals, you get control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing, and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to sensitive company data. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing. Extra security features are available like single sign-on sign and two-step verification. You want to give it a try? Take advantage of your employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash business. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. This afternoon, Apple announced record quarterly earnings again. There was strong demand for phones, especially in China, that helped the company beat Wall Street's revenue and profit forecasts. The company reported $58 billion in revenue and 61.2 million iPhones sold. The only disappointing figure in the bunch seemed to be the number of iPads sold, only 12.6 million in the second quarter. Yes, very disappointing. Still a lot of iPads. In another effort to keep you locked inside the Facebook ecosystem, today the company added cross-platform video chat support to Facebook Messenger in iOS and Android. This means you can use Facebook Messenger on your mobile device to make a video call. You could, of course, do that from iOS to iOS devices with FaceTime, and you could go cross-platform cross with Skype. But if you're the type of person who already communicates via Facebook Messenger or your contact list is full of people on different platforms and people who generally feel more comfortable in Facebook than Skype, this is good news for you. In more good news, Kerbal Space Program, the NASA and Elon Musk approved space simulator game officially launched today. Kerbals are the astronauts that look like a cross between Homer Simpson and SpongeBob SquarePants. Your job is to, as a rocket designer is to keep them alive 
Kerbal Space Program has been in early access mode for a while now. That's how the budding astronauts at my house have played it. The first playable version came out in 2011. It's been on Steam early access since 2013, but version one officially lifted off today. The game lets you use and design and build your own rockets and then launch them into space following the laws of physics. According to Quartz, version one will include some new features, including female astronauts. But female Kerbals are not the only positive role models to hit the gaming world today. Chelsea Stark from Mashable writes, forget Adam and Eve, Minecraft now has a Alex and Steve. That's right. This Wednesday, Minecraft developers will roll out the first default female character. Her name is Alex, and her free Minecraft skin has thinner arms, redder hair, and a ponytail. You can play her right from the beginning of the game instead of having to wait like the other skins. And finally, right now, we can unlock our phones with a password or maybe our fingerprint, but according to digital trends, in the future, we might be unlocking our phones with our ears. Researchers at Yahoo Labs are working on a technology called body print that uses biometrics to scan body parts that can be used to identify you and unlock your phone. As long as your phone has a touch screen, you might be able to hold your phone to your ear to be identified. And these kinds of scanners could be cheaper to implement than the more expensive fingerprint scanners in use today. This might be the time to admit that I have pointed Spock ears. I would show you, but I won't now that I know you can use them to hack my phone. If you have feedback for the show, send it to tn2 at twit.tv. Thanks to Daryl for writing about my interview with Hamilton Klein on episode 323 last week. Daryl says he appreciated the show since too much of the tech news seems to be run by tech journalists who don't really know anything but Apple. And it was nice to hear from someone doing artwork and to find out he's using a stylus and not finger painting. And Daryl continues that there was one piece of inaccurate information that was shared. The Surface 3 is not the same type of device as the original Surface or the Surface 2. The Surface 3 is based on the current generation of the Intel Atom chip and also runs full Windows 8.1 and can use the same stylus as the Surface Pro 3. Daryl is correct. Now, we've talked about the Surface 3 a few weeks ago with DaVinci Hardware, and I had a feeling that Hamilton was not referring to the latest version when he said it didn't run on the Atom chip. So thank you for writing and pointing that out, Daryl. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News, today every weekday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.